today we're protesting about the closure of 150 remote communities in WA. Um, the Premier of WA, Colin Barnett, and our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, have both come out and said that they will close the communities, that they're not economically viable. And as Aboriginal people, we know that that's a lie, that they're closing them for the mineral resources that are, these people have been on. Well, they're on. The government has come out and said that they're going to close the communities. The reason that we're standing up and fighting is, I'm, a, I'm from the East Coast, I'm a Bundjalung woman, and I have the luxury that my great-grandfather and my, his brothers walked off the missions and they said this is not right, this is not culturally right for us, we need to go back where we can have ceremony. Um, so they walked off country and since moving to Brisbane I've noticed that a lot of young people up here um, don't have the connection to country that I have. Um, they don't know where their country is, they don't know their language and it has massive, so young people have massive identity issues and it's showing themselves in remote communities and are like we, young people, Aboriginal people, we are the highest rate of suicide in the world um, and for us, for the government to propose to close the WA communities, they're basically closing communities that they have never um, lost connection with their land. We have children there that can speak four Indigenous languages before they can speak English. Um, so they have their culture, they have their ceremony, they live within their cultural laws. And as East, um, black girls from the East Coast, we want to stand up for them because we don't want them to lose that. We know what it's like and all the problems that have happened, whether it's like the flow and effects of health, the um, being disconnected from like the wider communities in the city. The connection of land is just, it's for our people. Our culture is about land and language. I mean, when we lose either of those things, we lose it all. Do you feel like people could get some of that certainty back in their lives in some way if they try to reintegrate them into culture at a political level? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, we see, I used to work for a company and we called Strongest Manga. It's an Aboriginal education um, educa institute. And what we used to do was teach white teachers how to bring culture into their school. And we've seen just from school students that it resulted in like 100% attendance, 100% completion of year 10 and 12. So it matters that the environment that you're putting Aboriginal children in, that it, um, it, it's part of their culture and they feel welcome there and they feel welcome to be themselves and not have to, you know, when I went to school, I used to think that I used to have to be white to succeed. Um, and that's a dangerous thing to tell young people. I'm just lucky that I have the right family that were like, no, I'm going to move you out of the school because this is not right for you. But when we're talking about people that have never lost connection with their land, it's dangerous um, for these kids to be put in that position. I think there's a mis misunderstanding in like the wider, like people from around the world. I remember, you know, I meet travellers and they're like, oh, you're Aboriginal. Oh my gosh. And they think that Aboriginal people live out in the bush somewhere and that sort of stuff. We're a modern people. We're the oldest continuing culture in the world. And we've survived because we have our culture and we have our connections to land and that sort of stuff. So I think um, one of the things when I talk about people who have come to Australia to visit and to, to tour around is that they come here because they're like, this, this culture seems so amazing. And it's just so sad that our government doesn't value our culture the way that the rest of the world might romanticize it. And, um, that sort of thing. We're a minority in this country. Um, our numbers are getting smaller and smaller. So it makes, and a, a lot of our people don't vote either because they're so disenfranchised and they don't believe that our politicians have done anything good for us, which they haven't. So it matters to have non-Aboriginal people here and spreading the word because they are the people that politicians listen to. You know, we've had protests all around the country. Um, even at the beginning of the year we had like 360 nations go down to Canberra and to talk about children who were being removed in communities and not one politician would come out and meet them. Um, and that is such that is such a huge gathering um, and for such a huge effort for people from remote communities to get to Canberra, to travel six days to be there and for our government not to listen. So I guess we've got to be smart and we've got to bring as many people as along as we can with us, so that's what we do here. So in this country we say Aboriginal people, but or well, they say Indigenous people, Indigenous people, they mean Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, we're two different people. And then when you talk about Aboriginal people, we're hundreds of different nations. Um, so one thing that hurts us is the fact that the government will allow certain people, Aboriginal people, to stand up as leaders for our people and speak on our behalf when they don't represent the broader Aboriginal population. Um, it's dangerous to us to have one person speaking up. That's why when we have a rally and we talk about doing it right and culturally being culturally appropriate is we get a lot of our elders to get up and speak. We get a diversity of people to come and speak. We don't speak on other countries' behalf.